Hi, this is Dave, a.k.a. Texas LDS. I've had the opportunity to read several books this summer, one of which, and probably the most interesting so far, has been The Clockwork Universe, written by Edward Dolnick, and it really involves the coming of the Enlightenment Age of Science. Now, the book starts out with a scene in 1660 of these three gentlemen, uh, founding members of the Royal Society of London. We have Robert Boyle, Christopher Wren, and Robert Hooke. And these gentlemen were encountering a world at that time that was considered developing more and more in chaos. Life expectancy was low. We had in 1665, uh, here on the left is a bill from that, the Great Plague of, of London. On the right here we have the Great Fire of London in 1666. What happened is that people in that era were considering these as possibly the end of times, according to the book, of, according to an interpretation of the book of Revelation, where one day in the book equals one year. They counted, added 1260 years to the year 400 and that comes out to be around the year 1660, so people were considering it to be kind of the end of times, uh, with the life expectancies being low, all these calamities about them, and so things were enveloping to be a mess. But these gentlemen of the Royal Society that were working on things, they were establishing and viewing the world as a world of order. And so they were making sense of all this. And the primary character in this book is, of course, um, Sir Isaac Newton, the, one of the co-inventors of calculus, but also the inventor, um, the founder of the theory of gravity, several important aspects of optics and so forth. Uh, one of the first characters pri prominently mentioned here is Nicolaus Copernicus, a... Uh, 16th century astronomer from Poland who really started the whole heliocentric solar system where the sun is the center. And he was very cautious about it because he realized that the things that he was suggesting and discovering were against what was taught in the time and particularly what was in the Bible. And so it wasn't until the very end of the life his life that he published his greatest work. One of his successors here, uh, Johannes Kepler, there are a few short chapters devoted to Johannes Kepler, basically his uh, bulldogged determination to make sense of this heliocentric solar system that we have. Uh, also Galileo, and Galileo had his experiments where, whereas Johannes Kepler was able to figure out that the orbits of the planets were essentially ellipses, uh, Galileo Galilei figured out the parabolic relation of, uh, of time, objects being dropped, and so forth. And so, again, we have an individual, Galileo, who's making sense of the universe. In 1609, Galileo heard about uh, a telescope that was used and in, invented, I guess, in Holland and used for mainly entertainment purposes. And he figured out how to make one. And in early 1610, he turned his telescope to the sky and looked at the moon as we now understand it for the first time. He subsequently was able to find, discover four additional moons of Jupiter. And he was very, very savvy in introducing the telescope as a valuable thing for studying the heavens. He took the eminent men of Venice up to the top of the highest church and looked out to sea, and they were able to spot at a distance, because of the telescope, um, ships coming in that the naked eye would not be able to recognized until two hours later. So this had a distinct um, 
this, this era was one of calamity where towns could be raided by uh, foreign invaders and so uh, this was distinctly a uh, maritime advantage. He also was savvy enough to have people look out and read signs from a long distance away and what he was doing with that, he was just establishing the reliability of the telescope so that when he would then have them look in the, in the sky at, say, the moons of Jupiter, they would understand and have confidence in him that it was not a trick. Uh, then, going small, we're, in the book were covered the discoveries, the invention of the microscope by Antoine von Leeuwenhoek. He was a, um, a textile merchant that was essentially using lenses to take a closer look at his weavings, but he found a microscopic world. And again, this was all in the direction of seeing the order in the universe, the order in the world, as a testimony of the existence of God. Uh, Rene Descartes, the great philosopher and mathematician, invented the Cartesian coordinate system we now use today. And he also wrote this great work, Discours de la méthode, that subsequently um, Newton and Leibniz used and studied to be able to invent calculus. Um, Robert Hooke, who I, who I mentioned earlier, a great scientist of the era, one of the founding members of the Royal Society, uh, he invented the vacuum pump. He was also greatly interested in optics and in uh, astronomy. And basically, he had a running feud with Isaac Newton. Uh, one of Isaac Newton's great quotes was well, something like this, if I have been able to see farther than others is because I have been able to stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, that seems kind of a magnanimous quote from an irascible person like, like uh, Isaac Newton, but really it was kind of a dig at Robert Hooke because Robert Hooke was sort of small and frail of body, and so by mentioning giants, he was in this quote, excluding Robert Hooke from that set of individuals. And then we got to the philosopher and mathematician Gottfried Leibniz, who independently, about nine years later than Newton invented calculus, and with whom Newton and Leibniz had a running feud about who invented calculus until the end of their lives. Eventually, uh, Newton kind of won out for one reason, because Leibniz uh, submitted for uh, complaint or for arbitration, if you will, a notice to the Royal Society about who invented calculus first to decide. Well, as it turned out at that time, Isaac Newton was the, was the president of the society, and he was able to craft responses that usually favored him in that discussion. And so Isaac Newton at that time achieved the fame much more so than Gottfried Leibniz. But uh, in later years, Leibniz has received more and more credit, and of course, uh, most of the notation we use for calculus today was developed by Gottfried Leibniz. Uh, enter Edmund Halley. Edmund Halley, in about 1684, discovered really the greatness of Isaac Newton and what, what he had been developing and encouraged him to, to uh, write what probably became the most famous scientific and mathematical discourse of all time, Principia. And it wasn't, uh, he had to encourage him, he had to go and uh, actually fund the project so it would be published in, in uh, 18, 1686. And one thing that's really good in the book is there are several chapters that sort of lead up to and look, look at the limits, the whole development of, of the concept of calculus, about looking at a small area. One thing that they, they didn't have in there was this uh, definition of a derivative, so i just show it to you here. Um, anyway, um, 
As far as why I'm bringing this up on the Texas LDS channel is because this whole discussion, this whole book, really gets into the whole development of religious thought in that era. Uh, back in the, the era of the book, there really wasn't such a thing as an atheist. Everybody took for granted that God created it all, that this earth that we have was sort of the lowest orb of creation where things were most degenerate, whereas in the heavens things were most perfect. So the closer to God and angels, most perfect, the earth more degenerate, and the location of hell was toward the center of the earth. And so what this, these discoveries did is they shook up everything with the replacement of earth as the center of the universe. Uh, with the sun as the solar system, it put human, the whole con concept of human beings on a different playing field. It really, um, it, these in, individuals here were using their discoveries as a, as a testament to the glory of God. Yet they created an environment where people would increasingly see that, well, is God really necessary? There was an argument uh, beyond the invention of calculus. There was, a, there was the, an argument between Leibniz and Newton over the nature of God. Newton believed that, that God created this clockwork universe that we have, but he, his idea was that while he invented the clockwork universe, God temp would make adjustments to the orbits and so forth so the universe wouldn't fall into chaos, chaos. whereas Leibniz said, well, if you really, you're, you're really limiting God, you're, you're really disrespecting God by limiting his ability to get it right in the first time when he set that clock in motion. Uh, finally, an image here on the left is one of Giordano Bruno, who was executed in Italy, I think it was Rome, in the year 1600, for theorizing that the, there were hundreds of planets like our Earth in, around. And so that was seen as blasphemy. He was burned to death, and even before he was burned to death, he had his his uh, tongue pierced with a stake, so he wouldn't he wouldn't utter blasphemous words when he was put to death. And then uh, later on, all the way to Isaac Newton, who uh, just in, made his greatest discoveries, is really started discovering things around 1665 to 1667. So within that short period of time, you had an individual put to death. Now, mind you, it was in Italy, and there was a lot, a lot less religious freedom in Italy. The Catholic Church was really reigning supreme and, and really hard, whereas in, as you went from France to England, uh, there were more liberal views and allowances. There was not in England an equivalent to a pope. Yeah, there was, there was a... Uh, there was the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, but he was not the type of individual that was putting down. He, these things were seen in England more as a testimony to the existence and glory of God. So it's interesting to think of this as we look at, uh, as we think of religion, kind of how it has evolved over time, how Isaac Newton. Um, really was trying to to glorify God and find his discoveries. What he did is he did such a good job of it that, uh, that then and even now people are able to to figure out or theorize that God is not needed. And so I thought this was interesting from a scientific view and also from a religious point of view. So I hope this is a book you might find interesting yourself. Thanks for viewing.